Amen. Amen means so be it. That means I set myself in agreement with what PG said. My seed is working. Praise God. It's multiplying. It's coming back to me. Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to get back into the Word tonight. You know, we talked about love last week, and man, love is so important, y'all. Faith worketh by love. Come on. Hallelujah. Hebrews eleven six. 6. We looked at that. Keep going to Luke. Keep going to Luke chapter 10. We looked at Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we know that Galatians 5, 6 says that our faith is going to work by love. So if we need, if it's impossible to please Him without faith, we're going to have to make sure our love walk is in order. Amen? Easier said than done, but guess what? The Bible says in Romans 5, 5 that the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. That's a powerful thing. So, so that means we need to learn to yield to our love nature instead of our flesh. I was a little bit transparent. We basically had to edit the whole message. I was like, PG, what, what do you want to keep? None of it. Just throw it all away. It's all just trash. Like it was all just flesh and just anger in it, right? No, love. Man, love is so important. I was listening to, to Brother Kenneth E. Hagin um, the other night, and just, you know, he was talking about when, the, when, when people would do him wrong, you know, just as a minister and Maybe he had a guest minister come into his church and like, like was like talking trash about him. And the devil would be like, don't receive an offering for him the next few nights. Just wait till Sunday night and then don't even like receive like a strong offering. Just be like, you know, this offering is going to so-and-so. And if you want to give, then, then give. And just to spite the devil, he took up like strong offerings for this person who spoke evil of him every single night. And then when he gave him the offering at the end, he asked the guy, he said, you know, what is your average? And so the guy told him what his average was. And what Brother Hagin was able to give to his ministry was three times his normal average. And a third of that came directly out of Brother Kenneth E. Hagin's own personal account. So literally, that means Kenneth E. Hagin gave him what he normally gets on average, plus what, what the church gave was two-thirds above and beyond his normal average. That's amazing. And so we look at the faith walk of Kenneth E. Hagin, and we look at the results that he got, and we look at his ministry, and it's like, yeah. And then we look at like the stuff that he did, and it's like, ah, I don't want to do that. No, I like the first thing, like don't take up any offerings for this jerk. You know what I mean? That's our flesh. And, and he just told of different stories of that, and I was just so just impacted and moved to like, man, we, we can get so far away from how this is really supposed to look. You know, you can quote the Word, and you can serve and do different things and still be a long, long way from really Christ-honoring in your lifestyle. You know what I mean? Like truly being right, being right in your heart. Even, even with different things over the years, like, like this building project, I would say that brought out the very worst in me, um, just in, in like not really staying in love. Yes, you can be professional. You know what I mean? Like you can be better in communication. You can be more clear. Uh, it, just even in business, like basic things. What is the scope of work? Tell me exactly what you're going to do and exactly how much you'll do it for. That's a basic principle of business. Now, if somebody doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, then you have it in writing. This is what you said you were going to do, and this is what you said it's going to cost. You haven't done what you said you're going to do. You can do that and still be in love. Like, hey, we need to talk because our initial agreement has not been met. Do you understand? That's like a professional, mature way to handle it. Instead of just going off the deep end and being mad and kicking papers and throwing, you know, kicking boxes, you know. No, there's a, there's a way for us to still be right but stay in love. Does that make sense? And that takes maturity. An immature person would just go off the deep end and fly off the handle, but a mature person would just be professional and say, Lord, you know exactly what happened. You know exactly what was agreed upon. We had references, and this person was supposed to be a good contractor. And you know exactly what happened. And, Lord, I cast the care of this on you. That's the godly thing to do. Well, that's what we have to mature into, that type of lifestyle where when it, when it comes down to it, instead of us trying to prove our case or trying to get even, we just cast the care of it on the Lord and say, Lord, you know exactly what happened, and, and I commit this to you. And, and just testimony after testimony from uh, Brother Kenneth E. Hagin where God would make it up to him, and God would make it up to him, and he would go out of his way to stay in love, and how God would supernaturally make it up to him. Just amazing. So that's the life that we're called to live. So 
We talked about love. We talked about the different kinds of love, you know, the, the brotherly love, you know, all the, the, the familial, the familial love, you know, and, and eros, like the romantic love that is an amazing thing. It's a gift from God. And even the perversion of the enemy where it would, the word erotic from the original word eros, you know, all of these things are of God, but they can be twisted and perverted by the enemy. But then we talked about agape. And that's like the strong, unconditional love. Like, I'm loving you not based in any way on how you respond. I'm loving you because it's the right thing to do. I'm loving you because it's in my love nature to love you. I'm doing what's right. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. And and, and there's really three things, and and I want to start off by prefacing. Number one, you have to know how much God loves you. And we've talked about that over the years. And honestly, the tower's probably still sinking. It's probably 15, 16, 17, 18 inches over. I don't even know. But it's still going down because the foundation ain't right. So the love of God is foundational. It's a foundational truth. And, you know, this story in Luke chapter 10 that I told you to turn to in verse 38 It says, now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus to hear his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, what'd she say? Do you not care? How many people have accused God of not caring about them? Like, I don't even think God cares about me. I don't even think he cares about what I'm going through. And it's like, I mean, we all get emo. Has anybody besides me been emo before? Come on, somebody. We've all probably been, to one degree or another, in that place where we're just, we were frustrated about circumstances of life, or, or maybe we were frustrated with our own failures, and we were looking for somebody to blame. It's like, it just don't, I mean, I've been reading my Bible and speaking the Word. It just doesn't seem like anything's happening, you know? But when you read the Bible, you see God cares the most. He cares more than anybody. And so we'll look at a few scriptures that kind of depict that just so we can clarify that. But really, I want to get into number uh, two, you caring for yourself. And the reason you must care for yourself is because I want you to care for others. Okay, so God cares for you. We're going to look at some scriptures. But you have, it would be like if a paramedic is like shot in the leg. Like he's not going to be very good at helping people on the scene of a car accident, because like, bro, you need to like, you need a tourniquet, bro. Like, you need to stop the bleeding on your own leg. You have to care for yourself, because you're really not in any place to help these other people, because if you do, it could be the last thing you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you need to get right so that you can get on the men and be a healthy, energetic, active paramedic and do your job. Do you, do you understand? And so, God, yes, God loves you. You have to love yourself. You have to invest in yourself for the purpose of having something to give to others. Does that make sense? Number three, others. So let's look here. She said, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha uh, is accusing Jesus of not caring, which I, I just even love, like, Martha, Martha. Like, you can just hear the love in his voice. She's chosen to hear the word. And, and obviously, the Bible talks a lot about serving. Like, Jesus isn't saying you don't serve. It's just that she's made the word in a place of importance. You're making it all about this meal at the end. I didn't even say I'm hungry. I didn't say, there better be a hot piping meal on the table when I get done preaching because I'm going to be hungry. Even though I'm about to have me one of them burrito things, you know what I mean, here when I'm done preaching. I was going to have it like, I'm like, yo, I'm going to skip praise and worship and eat this, you know. But then I was like, no, i gotta get, I got to get my worship on. And Grace is like, ah. <laughs> just keeping it real. The thought did go through. So they're doing one song or two. <laughs> I go out here with like, like tomatoes in my teeth and, you know, a little ground beef, you know. Nah, man. I didn't have time for that. I'd pray in the Holy Ghost and meditate and, and seek the Lord. For what he has. Listen, this is helping you because I don't want you to get to the end of your life and find out I live for me. I didn't help anybody else. I didn't pour into anybody else. Nobody, other people weren't even on my, I didn't even think of that. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, other people. I was like trying to get mine. Right? And, and it's, it's in our carnal nature to get, oh, I'm going to get mine. You know what I mean? I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of. Like, watch me. You know, it's like, like, when it gets competitive, like, I'm like, I don't like that. Because I was on stories, and it's like, I thought you had to grab the little thing when it popped. I'm like, really, this little girl? I'm going to, like, physically, like, tear it out of her hands? 
on international television? <laughs> and then I found out, okay, it's, you don't have to go. <sighs> right? It's like when there's only a few spots left. I'm, I'm, me and my crew, we're going to have seats. You know what I mean? Like whatever it is. It's kind of in our fallen nature to be like, to hell with all y'all. <laughs> me and mine, we're getting ours, right? If there's only seven left and we need five for the family, I'm getting the five, I promise you. You know what I mean? Like, I'm getting the five. Like, there was this one time on Pastor Charity's birthday, there's this one thing that we like to do. In Dallas, and you have to have tickets, and we had done it, like, in the previous years, and it was, like, super fun. And they were like, hey, let's do that. And then, like, I call, no answer. I get on the website, sold out. I'm like, oh, my. I'm like, I'm going in there, and I'm coming out with five tickets, bless God. And guess what? I came out with five tickets because I'm going to get mine. You know what I mean? And they're like, they're like, how'd you get them? I'm like, let's not talk about it. <laughs> how much was it? Let's not talk about it. No, but, but it is in our nature to, like, go after what we want. But when, you're, when your wants change, and it's like, I want to help people, now you're on the right track. See, because you take that, I'm not taking no for an answer. You take that aggressive we're going to get it done, right? Well, that's why I tell, like, the guys around here, we don't take no for an answer. Like, you're trying to drill through the ceiling, and this steel is, like, 50 years old, and it's, like, super hard. And the metal shavings are, like, falling on your neck, and they're hot. And you don't care because you're like, ah, oh, it feels good. It's like one time I was drilling, like, um, you know, Lord only knows, probably a security camera or something in here. And it's just like you could give up, and I guess you're high. Or you could just keep going. But it's the same way as it pertains to you reaching and impacting people. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't take no for an answer. I'm not quitting. I'm not backing down. I don't care if my family is crazy. I don't care if they don't support me. I don't care if they think this is a cult. This is where I come to, to feed on God's Word and to grow and to be around like-minded people who aren't just living for themselves. You start laying down your life and not caring about your life and your future and your plans and your family's plans and just saying, listen, I'm going to take this one day at a time and I'm going to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And listen, I don't care if he's got to provide manna from heaven. He's done it before. He'll do it again. I don't care if he has to part the Red Sea so I can walk through on dry ground. I don't care what he has to do. He'll do it for me. And you start trusting in God and walking after the things of God and walking after the Spirit. Not everybody's going to like it. But when your want to changes, and that's what you want to do, I want to serve the living God with every breath I have, with my energy, with my voice. It doesn't mean you're called to the ministry. It just means your whole life is about what it is that he is, is, is passionate about in his, his kingdom. People receiving Jesus. People coming into contact with true spirit-filled believers. People whose hearts are full of the love of God. Right? Where they actually have a fair shot at knowing what a Christian actually looks like. Not some weirdo who like doesn't even show up to work on time and all they want to do is quote scriptures. It's like, bro, your boss isn't like inspired by your Christian walk. He's annoyed that you can't even get your butt out of bed and be on time to work. Do you know what I mean? Like basic stuff. So, so we got to be like Jesus. Jesus did all things well. He did everything with excellence. So when we start thinking about other people, it's no longer about us, only to the extent that we know we have to take care of ourselves. We have to feed on his word. We got to take care of ourselves so that we have something to give. It would be like if somebody was going to be a personal trainer, but they didn't really know that much about fitness in the human body. It's like, uh, do some curls. You know what I mean? You do some curls. What else? Uh, bench press. Okay, do some bench press. What else? Uh, hold on. Let me get on Google. You know what I mean? Bro, get out of my face. You're wasting my time. You don't know what you're doing. You don't have like, you don't have like a program. You got to know what you're doing. <laughs> right? So <laughs> when you get in the Word and you start finding out and, and, and stop trying to be what somebody else is, right? Like Pastor Faith, she's funny. I, I don't try to be funny. Why do I need to be funny? She's funny. Let's be, I'm going to be logical. Hey, here's the logical thing to do. Or I'm going to be aggressive. Hey, let's get this before they get this because we're going to get it. Right? You need to be who you are. God created you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. All of our personalities are different. If everybody was one way, life would be so boring. But God created you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. So 1 Peter 5, 7, turn over there because I want you to put your eyes on this very important verse. And listen, guys, as you receive this message, then you have a responsibility to do something with it. But at the end of your life, you'll be so grateful that you allowed the preaching of God's Word to change your trajectory and say, listen, I'm going to invest in myself because I want to have more and more to give to people. 1 Peter 5, 7. This is so important. 
It says, actually, let's start in 6. Actually, let's start in 5. <laughs> actually, just kidding. 5. <laughs> Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Everybody say submit. You know, what I love about you guys as young people is as you're, you know, stepping out into real life, obviously high school is all just fake. You know what I mean? Yeah, we go to the volleyball games and we chant at the other team about how bad they are. You know what I mean? And do all that fun stuff and prom. But that is nothing like real life. Okay, so you guys are on the ground floor of what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to build your life on? Which, which, where's your confidence going to come from? Is it going to come from your father's love for you, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you're created in his image, that he cares for you, like he's, he's helping you go, go from faith to faith? So verse 5, submit yourselves to the elder. Yes, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the Humble. Humble is something that we can do that increases the level of grace on our life. Verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Amen? Verse 7. This is where we wanted to get. Casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. So that, when we cast our care on him, that's our worry. It could be things that are distracting you. It could be things that are weighing you down, anxiety, things that you've been toiling about or, or, or fear has, has basically tormented you. It, it doesn't matter what the scenario is. It matters that you cast all those things on him because you know he cares for you. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's fear, so to speak, of the future or, or wonder like, oh, oh, what about, you know, how's this going to work out? That's toil. You're trying to figure out how to make it work out. How's this going to go down? Like, okay, you need to just unhook the mind and be like, you know what? I don't care how it's going to work out. I'm just going to cast my care on the Lord because he cares for me. Oh, that was a close one. I almost took all that on. I feel so much lighter now. You understand? So if you do that, 1 John, you don't have to turn there. 1 John 4.18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment. If you, may, if you entertain that fear about the future, which really that's what it is. You could be like, well, I was just planning. Uh, okay. Were you planning in faith? Like, it's going to be amazing. Or were you like, how in the heck is this going to pan out? Because when it's, when it's of that context, it's rooted in fear. It's like, you know, your mind is like, hey, red alert, red alert. What are you going to do about this? So you have to turn that off and say, no, I cast that on. I cast my care on the Lord because he cares for me. I don't know how it's going to work out. Now, fortunately, my personality played into that. I'm not a super big planner. I just kind of go one day at a time. And so I, I, I didn't plan out my life, but I obeyed. And I had enough humility and cons true consecration to the Lord. Like, Lord, you tell me to go to Africa. I'm gone. But he told me to move to Hobbs, New Mexico. So I'm like, hey, yo, mom, dad, I'm moving to Mexico. See you later. And dad's like, hey, we're supposed to put the fence up this weekend. Yeah, I'm going to be gone already. <laughs> Straight up, he has this huge white fence. It just goes all the way up the hill, and then it goes down the other side. I wasn't there when he put that fence up. I, was. I think that might have been why I moved. It's like, how long is that fence going to be? <laughs> no. <laughs> May the Lord be with you. Be warmed and be filled. I'm out of here. No, but I felt led in my spirit, and, and fortunately, I, I'm not a worrier, so I didn't worry like, well, what, how, well, I mean, but I, I don't have a place to live, you know. No, I'm going, and, and I trust God. He told me to go to Bible school. I went to Bible school. Okay, what next, Lord? I, in the first year is straight-up Bible training. The second year, I, I trained more in youth ministry, and then the third year, I trained in worship school. It's like, okay, what next? I'm just, I'm, I'm ready. New Mexico, huh? New what? I wasn't that good in geography. I was like, what? I don't even have a passport, Lord. <laughs> you know, people say, do you have to have a passport to go there? And like when people say it to me now, I'm like, you're stupid. It's a state. It's a state, bro. Look it up. <sighs> We're important. Gosh. <laughs> Grace is filled up. Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> I love that. Second Peter, good word. Good word. That's a good word. Second Peter 3 9. Look at look at the love that God has for, for all of humanity. He's not really being slow about his promised return. Remember, like Jesus said, I come quickly. Oh, really? He got a sense of humor? <laughs> Where you at, man? It's getting crazy down here. Well, what does it say? <laughs> it is getting crazy. <laughs> Hide your kids. Hide your wife. They're taking everything around here. <laughs> They're taking backpacks with Bibles and notebooks. <laughs> I told somebody, I was like, I was like, 
Matt's so funny. He's been here for like a couple of years. He's been like nine fights. I've been here for a lot longer. There's always people in the parking lot. Like, you want some of this? You want some of this? And they're all like, they're all tweaking. And Matt's like trying not to laugh. You know. <laughs> It's like, man, it's getting crazy. It's getting crazy down here. But look at what God said. He's not slow concerning his promise, even though some feel like he's being slow. But what? He's waiting for the good reason that he's not willing that any should perish, but that they should repent. He's giving sinners time to repent. Don't be afraid of that word repent. When you tell people about the gospel, it's not just like, hey, Jesus loves you. and If you say this prayer after me, you'll be saved. Then you can go right back to whatever you do. No, there's a life change that takes place. Like, hey, you don't have to be bound by all that crap that is literally, number one, the wages of sin is death. So every, everything that you're doing that's a sin against your body or against the Lord, it's bringing a wage of death. Just like if you have a job, you come to an agreement, this is the hours you're going to work, and this is the wage that we're going to pay you. And when you show up to work, then you get a wage for that. When you sow sin into your life, there's a wage coming your way. So you have to be, uh, you know, sound enough in your doctrine. You have to be whole as a person. You have to be scriptural enough to be able to know because you can tell people all these things in a way that compels them to change, in a way that says, wow, so Jesus did what? He actually broke the power of sin so I don't actually have to be under it like a weight anymore? That's exactly right. He broke it, and you don't have to yield to it anymore, and he, he'll, actually, he'll actually give you power to resist. He actually won't even allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. He'll always provide a way of escape. Say, what? For real. Watch. Put God to the test and see what he does. He always provides a way of escape. Hallelujah. So that's the God that we serve, but that's the gospel we preach, a, 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 a life change. That to repent is to turn away. And, and what people, people who are really hungering and thirsting after righteousness and truth— they want something real because they know alcohol only works, you know, one, maybe two days, depending. You know what I'm saying? But eventually, you're coming back down. Same way with drugs. Maybe a couple days, you're stoned out of your mind. You're, like, cleaning the house like a crackhead for four days straight. But eventually, you're coming down. And it's, you're coming down hard. So people who are stuck with these temporary empty fixes, they know it's empty. And if you got something real and there's compassion in your voice because you actually care about them and you actually know that God is a God that saves, heals, delivers, like he, he's the real deal, then, then God can work through that because his word is anointed. And you start preaching the gospel to them and sharing with them, like, if you really want to change, the Lord will empower you to change. He'll equip you. He'll give you power over all the power of the enemy. You should want that. And if you really want that, I'll, I'll be glad to lead you in receiving that gift from God who loves you. That's a big deal. We're not tricking people into saying the salvation prayer. Like we, uh, we live and walk, and we endeavor to be Christ-like. We endeavor to be holy for he is holy. Yes, our righteousness is in Christ Jesus, but because I'm righteous, I live righteous. Can I say that? Don't, don't get me off on the whole sloppy, sloppy grace garbage that makes what Jesus did so stinking cheap. Lousy, crap, junk, you can do this and this and this, and God will still love you. What a crappy way to say what actually happened. <sighs> you guys feel that? We're done there, okay? For him to be accused of not caring crazy. He's the one that cares more. Romans eight thirty two. he spared not his own son. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with Jesus, that's Romans eight thirty two. how shall he not with Jesus also freely give us all things. John 3, 16, write these references down. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jot down a few more of these verses. Jeremiah 29, 11, The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. A big part of your future and your hope is you actually being a factor in God's kingdom. You actually doing things that will matter for eternity. So, yes, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and, and he adds all these things. He gives us all things richly to enjoy. Those are all scriptures from his word. We know his desire is for us to experience good things. But those things should not mean the world to us. And, and really, once you get over that, that love of, of things and you get over into this seeking first of the kingdom, then it's like, of course, the things are going to come, but the things don't mean anything. If they're gone, you know, gone tomorrow, no big deal, because that's not my life. My life is to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords the one true God, and it is my honor to serve him, and, and it could be in the marketplace. It doesn't matter where it is. It could be in ministry. It doesn't matter what it is. It matters that you do it. Does that make sense? So this is a privilege. So as we transition real quick into us, 1 Corinthians 4.2, write that down. 
Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. So I want you to be trustworthy over what God has put in your hands, and I mean your life. I mean your voice. I mean your influence. I mean the people you know that I don't know. And I want you to get so full of the Word that you just can't help but tell them the truth and tell them that Jesus is the way and tell them that there's a way out, and if they want out, man, God will help them. So get that on the inside of you. You're, you're stewarding your life. Colossians 3, 2. Whatever you do, work heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. So you're not doing this for me. You're not doing this for uh, Pastor Charity, Pastor Faith. You're doing this as unto the Lord because it's the right thing to do. It's the honorable thing to do considering what he's done for you. 1 Peter 4, 10. Each of us have received a gift. We should use it to serve one another. Serve one another. This whole thing is about you being an influence on other people, you being a help to other people. Other people looking at your life and be like, they're making changes, I should make changes. Right? Not for the sake of them like, oh, look at me, I'm making changes. No, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said. Amen? That's how I want to be and that's how you want to be. Come on, somebody. Romans chapter eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. That means he does not change his mind. Okay, your little sin from your past, your mistake, your abortion, whatever it is. Uh, the blood of Jesus is bigger than all that. That's why the Bible says we confess our sins. Father, I repent. I judge that as wrong. I did this and this and this. He is faithful and he's justified in doing it because Jesus bore the wages of that sin. He took the penalty of sin so that we could experience freedom. So you just draw a line in the sand and say, that was the old me. They're dead and gone. I'm crucifying them. I'm, I'm moving on to new things in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That was the old carnal me. I'm changing my ways. I'm making the word important. I'm allowing the word to empower me to walk free from sin. David said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Pastor Cherry was preaching tonight, and you, she's the most amazing preacher of all time, and she was just sitting on the edge of this chair, and she was talking about this person, and this person was like kind of spilling the beans. Not really. I think they were pretty much caught. But they were talking about what happened. It's like, well, like, what were you thinking? It's like, well, we planned it like a week in advance. It's like, what? What, you planned it a week in advance? Well, what were you thinking after? I felt real bad, so I went home and read my Bible. Okay, bro, bad timing award. You should have been reading your Bible last week. And you'd be like, hey, yo, why are we meeting up low key? Why are we hiding? Why are we doing things privately? Why are we doing things in the dark? Secret. Why is there secrecy just shrouding our entire life? Because you haven't hid the word in your heart. Because the Word makes you fall in love with God, makes you not want to sin against Him, makes you want to honor Him, and carry yourself with integrity in a way that He gets glory. People look at your life and be like, that person loves God. They're serious about how they carry themselves. They're serious about how they represent Him. They're not flippant and casual like, no, it's cool, we can do it. I remember when I was a kid, man, when I was sinning, man, I just I felt terrible. You know what I mean? I'm just like trying to be a little, uh, I'm trying to be a little, what's the right word? I was a little bit confused and insecure and kind of on the wrong path. You know what I mean? I was trying to buy a Bone Thugs and Harmony CD, and I'm like, somebody from the church is going to see me buying this. I just know it. Somebody's going to go to hell. Somebody's going to turn from their salvation because they see me trying to buy bad music. You know what I mean? I felt the weight of, like, I'm a representative of Jesus. I mean, my God, I had like a wig and a mustache. And <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, but that'd be funny, though. <laughs> Right? It should be weighty. It should be weighty. You know, it should be weighty. <laughs> Story time's over. There's too many people from Council Bluffs in here. <laughs> One, two, three. Just kidding. Here we go. Did I give you uh, Romans eleven twenty nine? Did that hit your notes? Let me give you one last one here. Hallelujah. Two last ones, sorry. Second Corinthians five fourteen. For the love of Christ constrains us. Constrains us. It's like my love for God constrains me from doing things I shouldn't do. The love that I have for him constrains me from, no, it ain't even worth it. Right? And, and what happens? Just like if you don't exercise, like when I had shoulder surgery and, and they reconstructed my entire shoulder. I've got a scar from here to here and I had bank art reconstruction and they put this little thing around your waist and it has a cuff here and a cuff here. So you cuff your wrist and you cuff your bicep because they don't want that thing moving, right? They put it all back together and rebuild it because like when it would dislocate like in football, then the ligament on this side, it tore away from the bone. So the ligament's like not broken, but there's a big chunk of bone. And it's just flopping around in there like painful painful this side 
they just stretched. So they like, did, we got this new technology we like to try on you. Sure, let's go for it. We're going to microwave your, we're going to microwave your ligaments. Hit them. So they microwaved them and shrank this side. And then they used screws to get the scar tissue out of the way. But the screws started backing out. And so like when I moved my arm, you could hear it grinding. Story time's over. So my third surgery, they took some of the screws out. They were like, I guess, you know, come on, bro, like, get them in there. But anyway, so this one, like one time I was standing in line, and this lady's like, why is your, why is your left shoulder so much higher than your right shoulder? <laughs> and I went home, and I looked in the mirror, like, why is my left shoulder so much higher than, y'all see that? I guess they rebuilt this one good, and then they did the microwave on this one. Y'all seeing this? <laughs> I want a refund. That was like $90,000. My God, it's like, now I just turned into my gangster lean. You know what I'm saying? I want a refund. I, just, I wish I, I should have I should had faith for healing. I could have gotten both straight or something. God would have done a perfect work. The doctor, he's like, nah, that's good enough. But what happened when my arm was in that brace for a long time? My muscles atrophied. And so I told the doctor, hey, when's my muscles coming back? He's like looking at me like, this kid is stupid. It's like, they don't come back. You have to build them back. And I'm like, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. You know, I've been building muscle for four or five years. And now it's like I got like one year of school left. How am I going to build four or five years worth of muscle back? So I was like, what a letdown. I was like, what a waste of time. Like, screw it, man. I'm never going to the gym again another day in my life. What a waste. Why? Because when it wasn't used, it atrophied. Right? And so if you're not using your faith and building your faith and feeding your faith, just like when, what does a bodybuilder do? Like, like um, you know, our, our friend, our sister in the Lord, uh, she is constantly feeding on protein and, you know, Lord only knows what, amino acids and all these things that are building blocks for the muscle. Why? Because she's serious about building that muscle. In the same way, we should be serious about building ourselves up. Why? So we have something to give. Come on, stop looking at my shoulder, y'all. Cut it out. <laughs> I'm going to raise this one up. Just make it look normal. I can't. It's down already. It's down already. <laughs> I don't know what to do. All right. <laughs> can, I get a, can I get a shoulder, pla- shoulder pad over here, please? Whatever. They rebuilt this one. It's like a rock. And this one, eh, whatever. But it's important that you build yourself up. Why? Because you want stop looking at my shoulder. Okay. <laughs> it's important. Why? Because you want to have something to give. So I'm telling you. You are a good investment. You know there's good investments and bad investments, right? Somebody goes and, and they buy like a $100,000 truck, you know what I mean? They drive it and they love their new truck and it's got a lift kit, you know what I mean? They put a lot of miles and they drive to Dallas and this, they're so excited. And then some person, see how I showed restraint there? Some person at Walmart like lets the car roll down and like gets a little ding in the side, you know, so the tires are worn. It's got a lot of miles and then they decide they're tired of it like two years from now. And they want to go trade it in. Hey, I brought my $100,000 truck back. They're like, all right, we'll give you forty k. Why? Because of depreciation. Bro, the tires are bald. It's got a lot of miles. It's got dings. I got a brand new one right over here that's hundred k. It's shiny and new and has zero, zero miles and brand new tires. That truck was never an investment. It was something you decided to purchase. Or you could take the same hundred k and buy a house. And a couple years later, what? That house is worth more than when you bought it. All right, thank God for inflation. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Just ride the wave, you know what I mean? Like, woo, let's go. My house, worth, oh, my house value went up 70000 It's magic. Yeah. Why? Because there are certain things, real estate, that would be more of an investment versus an automobile is never an investment. It's a liability. Why? Because it costs you money. Now, if you start a business and that, that vehicle is generating money, now it's an asset. Why? Because it generates money and puts money in your pocket. Young people, you have to understand the difference between an asset and a liability. So if, it, if it, you, you buy a business or you start a business, that's an asset. Why? Because it brings money in, right? When you purchase things like, I have this new thing, but it's an asset. If it's not generating money, it's not an asset. That's the simplest way to look at it. Do you understand? So what I'm saying is there's certain things that's like, that was not a good investment. Like, if you enjoyed it, that's fine and keep rocking it, but don't expect it to be worth 100K two, three years from now. It's just not. It never will be because it was never an investment. You are a really good investment. Every ounce of time you put into yourself, cultivating yourself, could be a training. You know what I mean? Invest by, by a training that, that helps you and, and helps you become a, a better professional or more skilled in whatever it is that you do. You're investing in yourself. But the most important investment you can make is investing the word in yourself. I want you to bow your heads close.